Hello friends and welcome back, this is another part in an ongoing series. If you've missed any of the previous parts, check the pinned comment to navigate things just a little bit easier. With that out of the way, let's jump into this. Working at an amusement park, down the rabbit hole. Written by Girl from the Crypt. Narrated by Brandon Dayton. I used to work at an amusement park, where only half of the actors are actual actors. While I wasn't sure about this yesterday, trusting my gut and therefore the bunny-headed girl has actually paid off for once. I didn't enlist Dale or his family's help because by now, I trust them about as much as, you guessed it, some random rabbit. That doesn't mean I don't understand where Dale was coming from. I do, and I don't even blame him. But it's hard to stay rational when you realize a person would willingly trade you for another. Calling a co-worker would definitely not have been an option, seeing as it took Dale over a whole day to get us here. So if I had been to call one of my friends, they would not only have to drive all the way out here with no detailed knowledge of the location, except maybe their navigation system, they'd also have to take me all the way back. And that's not something I have time for. Also, even though it hurts to say this, there's not too much I have left to lose anymore. I was at a point where my main motto was simply, fuck it. The short break the rabbit-headed girl and I took from walking was spent on a small clearing in the woods. I was leaning against a tree. I had just relayed the details of the wager to her. She was sitting across from me with crossed legs, regarding me attentively. My name's Madeline, she suddenly said. Uh, what? I was a bit caught off guard. I don't need to know your name, but my name's Madeline. It's the name my parents gave me. I'd like for you to call me that. I slowly nodded, and Madeline's ears twitched slightly. We're pretty close now, by the way. It's very important that you're well rested. You're gonna need to be in your right mind for you to enter. I had already strongly suspected this, but I still had to ask. You're taking me to the underground, right? Madeline nodded. Yes. Are you, like, okay with that? I am, I replied with a soft sigh. <sighs> Nothing left to lose here, so... Why are you helping me exactly? Why do you hate the wild ones? Aren't you one yourself? I am, but I hate that too. The wild ones are bastards, the whole lot of them. She cleared her throat. Her voice was faltering and squeaky. About a year ago, they took me. I used to live with my mom and dad, and my little brother's near the woods. These same ones right here, just way further up there. She pointed behind us, roughly into a northern direction. One night, when I was awake, something came in through the window. It was summer, so I left it open. There were like two or three of them. One dragged me out of bed while holding my mouth shut. And then the other one... The other one just slid under the blanket. And it suddenly looked just like me. The other one held me real close, and I tried to scream, but... It didn't let me. It jumped back out through the window and brought me... You know where. It kept me there, and... Well... I'm actually not even allowed outside. No one is. But when Warren came through... Everyone kissed his ass, of course. They all got out of his way, so I just, you know, I just snuck in after him. No one watches out for the rabbit kid when that gross asshole's coming through. She almost sounded proud of herself. Everyone says he's on thin ice for acting the way he did, but no one does anything. Not yet, at least. I'm sorry to hear that about you being exchanged, I remarked. Not sure what else to say, but... Will going through the underground really help me get back to the park faster? Definitely. Time works different down there. And space, too. It's hard to describe, but you'll see for yourself. Everything that's big up here is way smaller down there. But we gotta be real careful. I heard a lot of them talk about how you more or less attack the ones in the park. So, you're telling me we're basically going to a nightmare underground world where everyone wants to kill me? Isn't that gonna get you in trouble, too? First off, it'll be worth it. I hate Warren, and I hate Moth and Mulberry. I just want to see the looks on their dumb faces. The ones who can stay on the surface, they just... She fumbled for words. They don't deserve it. They don't even hide like the one who replaced me. They're just in plain sight of fucking everyone. I know it sounds stupid, but I hate them for it. Like, out of everyone down there, I hate them the most. I tried to smile at her. She was really being a bit childish, but... If a grudge like that would be getting me back to the park, so be it. Say, is there anyone who, like, makes the rules down there? You know, who runs this place? 
Madeline thought for a while before answering. I guess you could say it's the old ones. Warren's one of them. The longer you're around, the further up in the food chain you are. Are there ones that are even older than Warren? The white bunny nodded. There are, but there's not too many of them. Those are the ones who are so angry at him, by the way. You don't just break a contract, you know? You don't do that down there. What makes it even worse is that the old ones are the same ones who see you as a pest as well. But don't worry about them too much. I'm sure we won't meet any of them. They're too idle to ever leave their sleeping places, really. Can't imagine one of them appearing in our way. I let go of a soft sigh of relief. That was indeed some reassuring news. I still gotta warn you, though. Humans have trouble entering the underworld. I remember my first few hours down there. It was awful. It's the air, you know? Do you have anything you can breathe into? I nodded and pulled up the collar of my shirt, pressing it over my mouth and nose. Madeline shrugged. That'll probably do, I guess. See, the air is... It makes you go woozy if you're not used to it. So try not to breathe in a lot. Won't they try to attack me? I asked. Not if they don't notice us, they won't. Madeline giggled and gave me a mischievous look. If I manage to sneak outside, who says we can't manage to make our way through as well? We just gotta be real inconspicuous. Then no one will even care. If things do go south, you can still fight, right? I cracked the rabbit-headed girl a reassuring smile. <laughs> I'll try, I said, suppressing a chuckle. Okay, what else to know? Stick by my side. Don't eat or drink anything you find down there. And don't talk to anyone but me. And try and hide that necklace of yours. They'll sense it. If I were you, I'd keep it on, though. It'll keep you from going weird, Madeline warned sternly. Going weird, I repeated, just in the process of taking off my necklace and looping it around my wrist so I could hide it under my sleeve. Uh, yeah. About that. I don't want to scare you, but I've seen people being dragged into the underground again and again. They try to resist, but then, when they're halfway through the changing process... They go all strange, and it's like they're suddenly super happy, and it's plain creepy. I can't remember if I acted like that too, but nowadays, it really freaks me out. Madeline stared at the grass in front of her. It's odd you remember all that so clearly, I remarked. Madeline simply shrugged and rose to her feet before helping me up too. I never forgot who I am. That's all. Let's go now. She didn't let go of my hand when we got back on our way. We walked deeper into the woods until we reached a large tree in front of which the rabbit-headed girl came to a halt. It marks the entrance, she explained curtly, a bit breathless. She then led me around the tree. On the other side of the trunk, there was a wide, pitch-black hole in the ground. My eyes widened as I stared down into the abysmal darkness. Madeline must have noticed my worried expression, since she looked up at me with wide eyes and asked, Do you still want to do this? Yes, I replied swallowing my apprehension. A strange curiosity had gotten a hold of me. I somehow felt like being on a roller coaster again, shivering with both excitement, fear, and anticipation. All right, here we go. Madeline's voice was firm, and she lowered herself to the ground, getting down on all fours. Stay behind me, she ordered. I did as she told me, and once she had disappeared into the darkness of the hole, I followed her. The soil under my palms and knees was wet and soft. I could feel it damp in my pants, and I had to duck a little to squeeze my backpack inside with me. The light of the surface soon lost itself in the pitch-black tunnel. Are we even going to be able to see anything once we're down there? I whispered, not daring to raise my voice. Yeah, there's always a bit of light. There's, like, tiny fires everywhere? Madeline replied calmly. I could see the faint white shine of her head bobbing up and down in front of me. We must have crept through the tunnel for minutes. I believe I held my breath for the longest time. My cheeks were tingling with nervousness, a sensation which intensified with every inch that brought me closer to the end of the passage. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. Suddenly, I noticed the slight smell of flowers and rotten fruit joined the fresh brown scent of the earth. It got stronger and stronger the further we descended, and by the time Madeline warned me that we would have to jump soon, it had completely filled my nose and throat. This is the end of the passage, my guide panted. Get ready for a bit of a tumble. With that, the white spot suddenly disappeared and I could hear a low thump coming from somewhere below me. Reaching out to feel my way about in the tunnel, I discovered that there was nothing there in front of me. I turned a bit so that I would land on my feet, not sure how big of a fall there was to expect, 
and then carefully pushed myself closer and closer to the edge until I felt myself slipping off. To my surprise and delight, I landed safely. My feet hit the ground first and instantly sank into its coating, which I assumed must be foliage at first. Looking down, however, I found myself standing in a sticky, gooey mixture of rotten fruit, definitely the source of the strange smell. Decaying flowers and wilted leaves, all resting atop an unidentifiable greenish morass. Glancing around, I noticed that we were in some sort of high cave, the walls of which were illuminated by dimly flickering makeshift torches that were mounted to them. Madeline grabbed my hand. Her naked feet had sunken in all the way up to her ankles. Let's go, she whispered, gently pulling me along as she moved forward, a squishing noise accompanying each of her steps. At the far end of the hall, the wall gave way to another passage, this one however large and easily accessible on foot. Before we had reached its end, however, Madeline gestured for me to stay back as she hastily leaned in to peek around the corner. All right, coast is clear she quietly exclaimed, waving me over. As we exited the passage, the first thing I noticed was the sound of water running. Upon looking around, I found myself standing in an even larger cave. There was what looked to be a spring in its wall, right next to where the passage ended. Murky, dark water was steadily splashing out of it, collecting itself in a ditch on the ground. I followed the canal with my eyes to find that it was running through the whole cave like a small river. Remembering what Madeline had told me earlier, I pulled my shirt over the better half of my face, so as not to breathe in too much of the fragrant air heavily hanging above us. The rabbit-headed child quickly proceeded to lead the way. I was surprised to find the tunnels and caves empty, and was just about to ask why this was the case, when she suddenly halted in her tracks. Shh! She uttered, even though I hadn't said a word. Can you hear that? I listened intently, straining my ears. Somewhere, ahead of us in the distance, I could hear murmuring. It was low and faint, but audible nonetheless. Okay, okay, don't panic, Madeline stammered, even though it sounded more like she was talking to herself than me. We're bound to run into someone at some point. Maybe we can sneak around them. We found the source of the whispers located in the room over. It was the largest cave yet. To my surprise, there were even trees and bushes growing inside of it. It looked like a small forest clearing, just underground. The dark rivulet was running right through its middle, as if parting the clearing in two halves. There were two people, or rather, two creatures, lying next to each other on the ground. I squinted to try and get a better look at them. They both looked faintly humanoid, except that their limbs were unnaturally long. Neither their legs nor their arms had the same size. I couldn't help but think that it had to be nearly impossible to stand upright, let alone walk like that. They appeared to be quietly speaking to one another, their voices low and husky. Madeline gestured for me to follow her as she hurriedly entered the clearing and sank down behind a bush. I did as she told me, thankfully silent enough for none of the two wild ones to notice me. We began to creep along the edge of the cave, hidden behind the thick green foliage of the hedge. As we passed the two resting creatures, I managed to pick up a few short snippets of their conversation. To my bewilderment, they weren't really talking. It was just words strung together in an unsensical manner. I thought I could hear things like sleep or leaf from time to time, but there was no way of being sure. It was grotesque. By the time we had reached the end of the cave, neither of the two had noticed us. Madeline quickly got up and began rushing into the next passageway, and I hurried after her, the fabric of my shirt still pressed to my mouth. I almost collided with her when she stopped in her tracks turned around and shoved me back into the hedge we had just emerged from. Covering my mouth with her tiny hand, she whispered, Someone's coming! Cowering among the leaves and twigs, we watched as something large exited the tunnel. At first, I could only see its feet and hands as we were pressing ourselves to the ground, and it was walking on all fours. But when I lifted my head a little, I could see the rest of it. I seriously wish I hadn't. The creature was knuckle-walking through the dirt, it looked like a mixture of a person and a large ape of some sort. That in itself wouldn't have startled me as much, but part of his face appeared to be... missing. It looked like half of his head had just melted into its skull. I swallowed hard and Madeline reached out to squeeze my hand. I shot her a grateful glance. When it had finally trotted past us, we got up again, quickly stumbling through the tunnel, 
me trying to catch up with my nimble guide. I noticed that we were following the little river. Every tunnel we passed, every cave we snuck through, the stream was always there. From time to time I would even lose sight of it for a short moment, only to find it in the next room that we entered. Occasionally I would even spot entrances to smaller tunnels which appeared to be leading to the surface. I remember thinking that I would never be able to navigate around a maze as complex as this, but Madeline was nifty. She seemed to know exactly where we were headed. Each turn and each step she took was decisive and determined. I can hardly fathom the creatures we encountered on our way. None ever seemed to notice us. A lucky circumstance only explainable by Madeline's skillfulness. The caves themselves were never too crowded. Sometimes they would be completely empty. Other times there would be up to five wild ones in them but we never saw more than that at once. The rabbit-headed girl appeared to be growing more and more confident. She had stopped frantically glancing around and checking if I was still behind her all the time. We were just walking through the probably 20th tunnel when suddenly she froze mid-motion. Oh no. I heard her breathe. Following her gaze, I almost instantly spotted the reason for her distress. Warren was standing on the far end of the hall we were heading towards, thankfully facing away from us. He seemed to be talking to another creature, a smaller, stockier one. It too, however, looked distinctly humanoid. Madeline quick-wittedly pulled me into the cover of a large, wide tree, and I hid behind it as best I could. That's one of the elders, she breathed, deep concern in her voice. We waited for a little while. I tried to pick up on what they were talking about, but I couldn't hear a thing. Judging from the look on Warren's already contorted face, though, the conversation was getting a bit heated. Finally, the other creature disappeared into one of the smaller tunnels, while Warren himself stomped off into our direction. I held my breath and sank to my knees, pressing myself against the bark of the tree. Madeline had laid down, pretending to be asleep. My pursuer strode past her without paying her any mind. I was just about to let go of a sigh of relief when suddenly, I felt cold, dry-skinned fingers wrapping themselves around my neck from behind. The grip tightened and I was pulled up from the ground, only to be forcefully spun around and look right into Warren's ghostly pale eyes. His mouth had stretched into a wide, gleeful smirk. Hello. He let out a loud, ferocious cackle, and for a split second I felt reminded of the laughing cowboy before I had actually known his name. I cursed inwardly at the realization that I didn't have my revolver at hand. It's funny how this came to my mind at such an unfavorable moment but I really did like him a lot better back when he couldn't talk. I spotted a single cockroach climb out of his mouth and into his hair. I bit my lip, struggling, and finally managed to kick him in the stomach with all my might. He let out a startled gasp and let go of me, and I took my chance to turn around and sprint towards the tunnel ahead. I didn't get too far, though. I was rapidly pulled back, and Warren shoved me to the ground, immediately placing a foot on my back. He pressed it right down on my spine, his heel digging painfully into the soft flesh right beside it. Remembering the locket wrapped around my wrist, I lifted my hand and pressed it against his calf. Even through the fabric of his clothing, it seemed to hurt him, seeing as he almost immediately stumbled backwards. I scrambled to my feet, lifting my fists as Warren got ready to lunge at me again. I punched him in the chest, earning a satisfying whimper as I felt my hand make contact with the soft edge of one of his bullet holes. My success was short-lived, though. Before I could even pull back, he had already grabbed me by the arm, twisting it painfully. He tried to seize the other one as well, the one with the locket, but suddenly he let out a cry of pain. It was only then that I realized that Madeline was not lying on the ground anymore. Instead, I found her large front teeth buried deeply in the flesh right above Warren's knee. She hissed as she whipped her head back, tearing out a small piece of flesh. She lunged forward, grabbed me by the arm, and before I knew it, we were on the run again. I was sure I could hear Warren howl in fury when he took up the chase again. We didn't bother hiding anymore. Instead, we dashed through the maze of tunnels and caves, side by side, both of us panting heavily. We didn't slow down, though. We passed multiple other wild ones on our way. Some didn't even realize that Madeline was dragging me along. They seemed dazed and apathetic. Others, however, jumped to their feet and began to follow us. By the time Madeline pointed up at the hole in the wall, a little above the ground, I could hear their hurried steps and excited voices echo close behind us. I jumped up first, grabbing onto the edge of the hole, and I pulled myself up as fast as I could. 
Not hesitating, I spun around and held both my hands out to Madeline. She grabbed onto them, and I heaved her up into the tunnel with all my strength. We hurried to crawl back out, the bright red light of the setting sun greeting us. Rummaging around in my backpack, I produced a couple of leftover laurel and sage leaves. I sprinkled them around the entrance and added some red verbena for my locket. I even placed some of them in the hole itself. You think that'll keep them from coming after us? I asked uneasily. Madeline nodded. I, for one, don't want to go near there now. Plus, we lost Warren anyways. I'm pretty sure we shook him off somewhere in there. The others aren't allowed outside anyways. That was at least a little reassuring. I let go of a deep sigh, my sides burning and my legs aching. Still, we got on our way. We seemed to be pretty much in the middle of the woods, but those weren't the same ones as before. I could tell by the look of them. It sounded like there was a highway nearby. I could hear the growling of car engines and the screeching of tires. Naturally, we headed towards it. I'm sorry. I wanted to take you directly to the park, Madeline moaned, sounding genuinely disappointed. Now I don't even know where we are. It's okay, I'm just glad we... My voice trailed off as we reached the side of the road. I knew this spot. Whenever I would drive out of town to visit my parents, I would take this exact route. From there to the park, it was only about a two-hour long drive. We're gonna make it, I squealed, ruffling the rabbit-headed girl's fur in a rush of excitement. I then quickly fumbled for my phone. I called Darius. I'm not sure why him exactly, but his reliable tranquility was just about what I needed right then. He agreed to pick me up without asking a single question. Madeline and I waited by the side of the road. When his car finally pulled up on the roadside, we quickly hopped in. Darius had to do a double take at my companion. I think for a moment he believed he was hallucinating. I relayed what had happened as quickly and roughly as possible, and he, level-headed as always, took it with surprising calmness. And here we are now, still in the car. It won't be long until we make it to the park. I'm not sure what will happen then, but for some reason, I'm rather confident. Sure, Warren got his hands on me for a few seconds back there, but I escaped. So that can't really count as me being captured. I think we're really going to make it. Oh my god, that was high tension action. I totally thought that Leah was done for. Whew. I thought the last part of the story was just like her slowly turning. But thankfully she did get away from Warren. And thankfully the rabbit-headed girl turned out to be a total sweetheart, just like Leah predicted. You guys are so close now. Oh, I cannot wait until tomorrow to see how this all finally ends. Ooh, such mixed emotions about it, though. My goodness. I sincerely hope that you guys will join me for it. It's been a long time coming. A full month of hanging out at Cryptic Park. And I loved every second of it. Wow. So, I'll see you guys tomorrow. I hope that you'll like, comment, and or subscribe on this video. Maybe share it around. I think I'm going to do like a, a giant mega compilation of all the parts into like a big three or four hour video. Maybe even longer than that. It's a very long series. So that you guys can enjoy it all at once. <clears throat> and also, uh, it will be a bit more shareable, which I think is good. But anyways, the channel is still growing. Thank you guys so, so much for your support. I'm super amazed at the things that we're able to do with this channel. So I, I couldn't be more appreciative. Once again, I hope that you'll join me tomorrow for the final part. I hope that you guys will keep yourselves safe out there. Until then, and until the next time, friends, bye bye